Hello and welcome to McKinsey Friend. Today we're going to look at reporting and surveillance with regards to family law proceedings. But first, the usual disclaimer. Whilst I hold a law degree major in family law, I choose not to practice nor seek admission. Therefore, any information cannot be relied upon. Specific questions should be directed towards an accredited family law specialist. Right, firstly, let's look at some judicial commentary on this issue. This is from Federal Magistrate John Croker, as quoted on the 4th of February 2013 in the Sydney Morning Herald. It is a matter which arises all too frequently, particularly in family law proceedings, and seems to have gathered support not only from parties to proceedings, but also from legal representatives. It would seem clearly to be an evidence gathering exercise that one that, in my view at least, gives rise to serious concerns as to the behaviours of a party who records such evidence. So this is saying the court just doesn't like recordings. Okay, let's look at the Family Law Rules 2004. Chapter 15 sets out the rules about evidence generally and in relation to children, affidavits, subpoenas, assessors and expert witnesses. Evidence adduced at hearing or trials must be admissible in accordance with the provisions of the Act, the Evidence Act 1995. Now this is important. However, there are exclusions under the Family Law Act from 69ZT to 69ZX. However, section 138, which pertains to illegally and properly obtained evidence, is still remains in effect. Right, let's look at section 138. Exclusion from properly or illegally obtained evidence. Evidence that was obtained improperly or in contravention of Australian law or in consequence of any impropriety or of a contravention of Australian law is not to be admitted unless the desirability of admitting the evidence outweighs the undesirability of admitting evidence that has been obtained in the way in which the evidence was obtained. This is saying that if the court determines that these recordings or this surveillance or this evidence is improperly legally obtained, it cannot be admitted, it will be set aside. So, because my law is from New South Wales, I have a little bit more familiarity with the um, New South Wales legislation. So each state has very similar legislation pertaining to reporting and surveillance. So New South Wales is Surveillance Devices Act 2007. Now we're looking at the four um, areas which regards to the prohibition on installation, use and maintenance of listening devices, the installation, use and maintenance of optical surveillance devices without consent, and the prohibition of insulation, use and maintenance of tracking devices, and the prohibition of insulation, use and maintenance of data surveillance devices. Now also other um, legislation can also apply, such as the um, Telecommunications Interception Act, which is a Commonwealth Act. So looking at um, seven, the prohibition on installation, use and maintenance of listening devices, a person must not knowingly install, use or cause to be used or maintain a listening device. To overhear, record, monitor, or listen to a private conversation to which the party, which the person is not a party, or record a private conversation to which the person is a party. So even if you're part of the conversation, you can't record it. However, there is an exemption where all the principal parties to the conversation consent expressly or implied to the listening device being used, which means if you, if the other person consents, or that you tell them you're recording and they continue to discuss, continue to hold the conversation, then you would say that um, if there's implied consent. Also, where it is reasonably necessary for the protection of lawful interests of that principal party. Now, this is a little bit more of a grey area. You can also see Marsden and Amalgamated Television Services a bit of a case law on this. Now, looking at um, installation, use and maintenance of optical surveillance devices without consent. Now, you note in this area, there's no exemption for the protection of lawful interests. So there was a matter that I read um, where the court admitted the audio content, but um, deemed the video content inadmissible. So the prohibition of installation use of tracking devices. This is also a difficult area. I've had a little bit of experience in dealing with matters where a party has used a tracking device. Now, a person must not knowingly install, use or maintain a tracking device to determine the geographical location of a person without express or implied consent of that person. 
Now, in the matter I have some association with, um, one party placed a tracking device on the other parent's car and also put a tracking device inside a child's toy. Now, the reason that this parent did this is because orders were made restraining that parent from traveling to certain geographical locations in accordance with orders were made. Now we're gonna look at the probation installation use of uh, maintenance of data surveillance devices. This also, there is no lawful interest protection on this one, and this would be a big no-no. Now let's have a look about this um, issue of um, consent. Now clearly, um, if a party expresses consent, it's all good. Um, or it's implied, so that those person knows they're being recorded and continues, that's fine or it's reasonably necessary for the protection of lawful interests of that principal party. Now, we need to look at what is meant by protection of lawful interests. The defence for a lawful purpose is somewhat unsettled. There is little case or commentary about what the court considers a lawful purpose to be. In the absence of any direct guidance, the meaning of lawful purpose could be taken to be similar to the meaning of lawful interests i.e. a purpose that is not unlawful, similar to a legitimate purpose or a purpose conforming to law. This can be found in the Oli and Berryvale Orchards at 28. So we'll look at that case just a little bit. Now, this is based on the Listening Devices Bill from 1994, which is obviously now being superseded by the Surveillance Devices Act. In the reading of the Bill to Parliament, the Bill establishes safeguards against the unjustified invasion of privacy that can be occasioned by the use of electronic surveillance. In doing so, it seeks to protect one of the most important aspects of individual freedom, the right of people to enjoy their private lives free of interference by the state or by others. People should not be expected to live in fear that every word they speak may be transmitted or recorded and later repeated to the outside world. Now, in this case, Branson Jay concluded the desirability of emitting evidence of Mr. Viley and the other two conversations outweighed the undesirability of omitting the evidence obtained by him in contravention of Section 5 of the Illicit Devices Act. So in this case, the, uh, Mr. Viley's legal representation was able to argue that the probative value of the evidence was sufficient to overcome the restraint under the Evidence Act. But that's not always the case. And this is somewhat a little bit different in commercial matters versus when it's um, involved in family law matters. Now we'll look at another case called Huffman and Gorman in 2014. This is a family law matter. It is common ground between parties that the recording of the private conversation between parties by the father is contrary to the provisions of the Surveillance Devices Act, thus rendering the recordings illegal and publishing of these recordings illegal. So that's very strong words. In Alexander and Turner in 2015, um, the father's lawyer argued that the recording should not be admitted into evidence because to do so will condone a child gathering evidence against a parent which must be contrary to the child's best interests. It is also condoning illegal conduct. This is also where um, I think believe a surveillance device was used. Now also, even if you're, it may not be technically illegal under the Surveillance Devices Act, the court still may consider that it's an act of family violence. So looking under the Family Law Act in section 4AB, one which has the definition of what family violence is, for the purpose of this act, family violence means violent, threatening, or other behavior by a person that coerces or controls a member of the person's family, family member, or causes a family member to be fearful. So important words there are coercion and controlling conduct. Now they give examples of the behaviour, but these are not limited. These are just examples given. And 2C is stalking. You know, it might be argued that, say, a tracking device in particular may be argued to be a form of stalking. So the recording of the other party or involvement of the children in the parent dispute could be considered an act of family violence or contrary to the best interest of the child. Because remember, as we know under Section 60CA of the Family Law Act, the paramount consideration is the welfare of the child and best interests. So a few comments. So you, it is possible to evidence notes for conversation in affidavit if those notes are made during the conversation or shortly after, which is called contemporaneous notes. 
making or re recording the transcribing the conversation into written form may not be a, considered a protection of lawful interest. It would depend on it. So I think the point would be, it is better to make notes of the conversation and put them in affidavit, you might say, on this date, on this time, I had a conversation with the other parent and this was stated. That is quite legitimate to put that in an affidavit. Trying to admit the actual recording could be more problematic. Now, the use of tracking devices. This is the matter where I discussed earlier, where the other parent placed a tracking device on the child's toy and on his car <laughs> to, um, to ensure that he actually was going to the places um, as detailed under the orders. In the end, the court was not concerned that you know, the father was visiting his girlfriend or was not staying at the locations as set out in the orders, but it was more, the court was more concerned with the actual illegality associated with the tracking device. So in the end, let's say it didn't end up well for the mother. Now, in this case, the mother at trial had to um, seek a certificate under section 128, which is the privilege with respect to self-incrimination, pertaining to that evidence. So the court was not impressed. And the probative value of the material in the end was essentially relevant. The, the, the child was not at any risk. So in conclusion, it is always desirable to evidence material that is admissible under the Evidence Act, especially the same allegation can be proven without resorting to seeking to admit legally and impro properly obtained evidence. Suffice to say, like, say a person had a conversation and they recorded it because they were protecting themselves from family violence and it was mentioned that um, the other parent held a property that was not disclosed in full and frank disclosure of, under the financial disclosure obligations. Then you will just evidence upon doing a title search of that material and you will not have to use the um, that evidence that was um, procured by the recording. That's just obvious. Now, to overcome the inadmissibility of the court, you would need to, the court would need to be convinced that the probative value of the evidence outweighed the undesirability of admitting the illegally or improperly obtained evidence. So you would have to be very sure that the evidence was of significant importance to overcome the illegality under Section 138 of the Evidence Act. Whilst it may be defensible to argue that recordings were made to protect a party from family violence, the evidence may be considered illegal admissible if used for an ulterior purpose. So I think it'd be very difficult to argue that you made the recording for to protect against family violence and then turn around and use information within that recording to prove another point. I hope this helps.